welcome to the Ghosts of Harrenhal. My name's Simon. And I'm McKelly. Thank you for joining us for episode 35 of our chapter-by-chapter book review of A Song of Ice and Fire by George R. R. Martin. Today we're discussing chapter 34 of A Game of Thrones, which is Catelyn's 7. We'll chat about the chapter and try not to spoil any future plot points for you, and hopefully we'll provide you with some entertainment along the way. We'll summarize what's happened, we'll discuss our thoughts on it, provide you some useful background, compare it to the TV show, and indulge in a little pedantry. Be sure to check out the show notes, they'll provide you some additional information about the characters and other things of note in this chapter. How are you doing? I'm doing alright. How are you doing over there? I'm alright. I'm alright. I'm going... I'm going a little stir crazy. I've I've really been confined to barracks like completely, apart from walking the dog around yeah. the block. That's all I've done in the last nine days. I think that's the only time I've been out of the house. Wow. Well, that's very responsible of you. Well, I'm trying. Yeah. Plus, plus people younger than me are getting like really sick from this. Right. So yeah. A little bit, I'm a little bit afraid. All right. It's uh, this is a long chapter, so we'll have to uh, get cracking. Let's do it. Which is not a reference to. Um, the Grey Joys. Alright, <laughs> quick recap of what Kat was up to last time we saw her. She'd taken Tyrion Lannister hostage. She'd thrown off her pursuit by going east towards her sister in the Vale, rather than north to Winterfell, which was the logical choice and also where she told everybody she was going. Her little party had been attacked by mountain tribes and is now so depleted that Tyrion has been unbound and armed to help with their defence. He's already saved Kat's life in the melee Sir Roderick was injured. McKelly, why don't we give them the summary? Why don't we? All right. As Kat's depleted party approaches the bloody gate, Sir Donald Waywood rides out to meet her. He says she should have sent word that the road is dangerous, and Kat can't help but agree. More of the group have died since the last time we checked in due to repeated raids from the mountain clans. It's now just her, Sir Roger Cassell, who is injured, as you mentioned, uh, Marillion, Sir Willis Wode, Braun, and, of course, Tyrion. So Roderick is not looking so good after his injury in the last chapter. Tyrion, on the other hand, no longer has the look of a captive being both armed and without binds. At the Bloody Gate, Cat has a touching reunion with her uncle Brynden Blackfish Tully, her father's younger brother. Sir Roderick can go no further, his wounds making him too weak to continue. So Willis stays with him while the rest continue on. So Brynden escorts Cat through the pass that leads to the Gates of the Moon, the ancient castle currently held by Nestor Royce. On the way, Kat relates the story to her uncle, as Kat is wont to do, including everything from Bran's fall to the dagger and her arrest of Tyrion. I can see you laughing over there. <laughs> Brendan tells Kat her sister might not be as welcoming as she might expect, and that she's a different woman from the girl that Kat knew. When they reach the Gates of the Moon, Royce tells Kat that she must continue on and the rest of the party will continue the next day. After a harrowing nighttime trek up the mountain, led by her guide, Maya Stone, Kat eventually reaches the Eyrie by morning of the next day. She is greeted warmly by her sister until the room is cleared. Once the pair are alone, Lysa's attitude changes completely. She becomes cold and angry towards Kat. Lysa is furious that Kat would drag the Vale into a war with the Lannisters. Kat then meets her six-year-old nephew, Robert Arryn. He is as thin and sickly as Kat has heard, and begins breastfeeding. That's a six-year-old nephew. Lysa has no interest in preparing or helping with a, blo- with a war. She believes they are safe and the eerie impregnable. The chapter ends with Robert ominously asking if they can make Tyrion fly, and Lysa saying they might just do that. Yeah, so there's a lot in this chapter. But right off the bat, I just we probably won't talk a whole lot about it, but I just loved the imagery in this chapter of the Vale. Yeah. It had a whole, like... um kind of some Shire vibes to it and some Rivendell vibes to it from Lord of the Rings. You know, they've got the the mountains and the little hamlets and uh, Alyssa's tears. I actually, I kind of just wanted to read a a little few sentences about some of the description. What are we here for if not to indulge your proclivities? (laughs) We just probably won't talk much about it, but some of the description goes like this. Looming over them all was the jagged peak called the Giant's Lance, a mountain that even mountains looked up to, its head lost in icy mists three and a half miles above the valley floor. Over its massive western shoulder flowed the ghost torrent of Alyssa's tears. And then, uh, so that was kind of the Rivendale part. And then uh, later when they're riding through the valley, cantering through verdant greenwoods and sleepy little hamlets past orchards and golden wheat fields, splashing across a dozen sunlit streams, 
Good stuff. And, and if we're going completely out of order, as you appear to have taken us, um, <laughs> I'll mention that absolutely none of that is captured in the TV show. Really? The TV show, they are on a sort of like narrow mountainous path until they're met by the Vale men. And then they're taken straight to the castle, which they never you never see the Vale. Oh. You never see anything like the Vale. Yeah. All you see is this sort of impregnable mountain stronghold the eerie and yeah. that's all you see so it's as if it goes from mountain pass to eerie with nothing in between <laughs> all this beautiful description's gone to waste for the tv yeah. show but... and and actually um physically the eerie is very different in the tv show yeah the in the in the book as as we'll talk about it's basically a vertical climb through three way um, castles, castles. Yeah. and those castles all act as defense all the way up this vertical climb um in the show it was just a very narrow path um on a bridge high in the sky oh. up to a castle on a peak okay and so the only way up it was that road which was very narrow and easily defended yeah huh. well i like the description in the book okay I'm glad. <laughs> it's good stuff so there is uh, a lot of content about the chapter i guess we should talk about yeah that's, that's what we're here for so cat's having an internal struggle is she wrong about Tyrion? Uh, uh, interjection. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> if so, this is all kind of stuff she's thinking about, actually. This is like her, her uh, internal struggle in her head here. If After so, the fact, internal struggle. Yes, exactly. If so, six men have died to get him here, and she thinks, what does that say about her? Uh, I don't know exactly what it says about her, but... I think the facts well, are correct. Six yeah, men have a, died to get him here, and I'm pretty sure he's innocent. So, yeah, she's a, she's a powerful lady. She's kind of used to men dying at her behest. You know, even if even if she's a good one, you know, right. this happens. Right. Well, it, she, one thing she didn't mention is um, that possibly starting a a war, um, a uh, realm wide war with this maneuver. So, yeah, well, that certainly seems like the logical outcome of this. Yeah, and they were saved by the... Uh, they didn't make it all the way to the Bloody Gates. Uh, luckily, Sir Donald Wainwood and some of his entourage had come out and found them. And he mentions to her, kind of backs up what Varys had said previously to Illyrio Mopatis in that Arya chapter. Remember, he said Stannis and Liza had both fled his reach and are amassing swords. And he says, I wish we could keep these roads safer, basically, but... Lady Liza has all of our, all of our knights staying in. Wouldn't even let them go attend the tournament. So, yeah, but but then that that's not quite what uh, Varys is afraid of. I mean, Varys is afraid of uh, armed insurrection against the crown in some way, right? Um, which is clearly not Lysa's mm -hmm. ambition here. It certainly doesn't. She seem is so. gathering troops defensively. She is worried that they are coming for her, right? And she's willing to defend herself against them. So, I mean. Not great news for the stability of the realm, and I imagine that's what Varys is really thinking about. But, but in terms of a sort of offensive threat, the the Vale are not really right. in the game. I don't think. No, he, I guess he doesn't know that because he's out. She's out of his reach. But they seem to be on full defense mode. Yeah, but I think I think it's a logical conclusion he should draw. I mean, she, he knows that she's fled for for. Little, uh, for sweet Robin, for her yeah, son. Yeah, she doesn't want, does not want him anywhere else other than by her side. Mm -hmm. And uh, the the best way to make that happen is to stay put and stay defended. Yes. So they finally do get to the bloody gate, and is, she has a really sweet reunion with her uncle Brendan, as you said, Blackfish Tully, who's the Knight of the Gate, which is his title as. I guess the guy that's in charge of charge of the bloody gate, right? So the backstory on him is that he um, he's the younger brother of her father, Hoster Tully. Yep, five years. And they they by five years, right? And they fought a lot. They were never friendly to one another, particularly it seems. And he was interestingly in the in the book he was described as the black goat of the family, which I think is the equivalent of the black sheep of the family, right. is what we would say. But then. Brynden pointed out that their sigil being a fish, he should be the black fish of the family, and then he, he created his own sigil based therefrom. Right. Uh, and also do dubbed himself the black fish, yes. and that's what people refer to him as. He he left, she mentions that he left River Run the day that Cat and Liza got married. He told Hoster, his older brother, 
I'm going with John Aaron and Liza to the Vale to serve them. And apparently, according to Edmure, Liza, uh, Kat's younger brother, uh, Hoster has never mentioned Brendan's name since. So That's interesting. That's interesting. I wonder if, um, I wonder, you know, because it, it sounds like they reminisce about Kat's childhood and how she her and and her siblings including peter baelish the yeah. foster sibling would all go to brynden with their tales of woe and their childish stories and he would always give them time and affection whereas her own parents were too busy with other things it's not coincidental that he left uh river run when they left home when they got married right that was his last day in river yeah, i hadn't so thought of that they they liked his company and he obviously stuck around only for their company his brother's company obviously drove him to distraction and he wanted out of there which is, also it's a bit of a slap in the face for edmure because edmure right. was still <laughs> so it's really your sisters i liked i'm out of here <laughs> that i hadn't thought about that yeah that's probably more than a coincidence yeah that he left when he did he refers to little Robert as the true warden of the East. And, you know, that made me think it, it goes back to my argument previously about how the warden of whichever direction really has to be the Lord Paramount of the region. Because in at least American sports comparisons, if you have two quarterbacks, you have no quarterback. You need one person leading the charge, one person in control. Yeah. And plus, I mean, when you made your argument, I, I bought into it. And this, again, just proves it all the more. The the loyal houses of the Vale are loyal to the Arons, right. not to whoever externally imposed Warden of the East. Yes. In this case, it's Jamie Lannister. But yes. Right. right. So, yeah, so Roderick can't go any further, must be in pretty bad shape because... Uh, He's pretty stoic. Yeah, that was apart my from too. apart from on a ship. <laughs> but unfortunately, the maester is up at the Eyrie, uh, more than a day away. Yes. So he's been left at the bloody gate in the charge of a septon. So Merillion, Merillion and Bran, Bron both go with her. Merillion asks, she gives permission, and then Bron doesn't ask. He says he'll go along too. And of course, having said yes to Merillion, she cannot really say no to Bron. Yeah. Yeah, she's got some mixed feelings on Bronn. She she mentions, she knows he's a great fighter and she knows they wouldn't have survived the Mountain Clan attacks without him. But she, you know, she says he has no kindness in him and he has no loyalty. And, you know, he is by title a cell sword. So loyalty is not exactly his strong suit. Right, right. But, I mean, she's certainly in a better position than Tyrion to pay for his loyalty in the short term. Right. Yes, in the short term. Yes, in the long term. If Bronn's a smart enough forward thinker, he might think, well, Lannister's a pretty wealthy. <laughs> yeah. <I> could... <laughs> he may not be able to give me a roast chicken right now, but <laughs> I could be eating roast chicken for the rest of my life if I work for this guy. Right. So it's it's on the way while they're traveling from the bloody gate to the gates of the moon, which is the, the first castle uh, that Cat fills. Uh, Brendan in on everything and she she mentions that it, it took so long it took much longer than she anticipated and I thought but she's so practiced at it I mean I wonder <laughs> I wonder if while they're on the high road if she keeps going to the guys like did I tell you guys about yes we know we know <laughs> and the mountain tribes <laughs> yes we're acutely aware <laughs> yeah yeah she's a blabbermouth <laughs> I mean, she isn't really, but it is kind of funny to make fun of her for being a black <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it's just funny, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, so uh, it's funny. Well, it isn't really funny, but Brendan's first thought is, was what Kat's first thought was, uh, that her father and River Run are the most vulnerable to attack from the Lannisters. And so uh, Huster, her father, must be told and uh, it's just, she mentions, yeah, I had that same thought. And I was like, so then why did you arrest him and make him your captive? <laughs> or at least not send a message. Right. <laughs> but then again, I mean, Huster's done nothing wrong. Cats are stark these days. River Run is fairly well defended. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, they certainly have defenses. Maybe there's, maybe there's nothing to worry about, yeah. And you would think, you know, River Run is kind of on the way to... Um, Casterly Rock, the word's going to spread fast. You'd think it might get to uh, River Run before they need to officially send word there. Yeah, I think so too. So uh, Brendan fills Cat in on life in the Vale, where he's been for the last 
15 years, I guess. Uh, the mood is angry since John Aaron's death. Lots of people are suspicious about it. And of course, Liza fuels those suspicions. Yeah. And uh, like I said, they're all the, the veil collectively is insulted about Jamie, uh, Jamie Lannister being named Warden of the East, a title that the Aarons have held for 300 years. So, yeah. But at the same time, those same. Uh, those same angry lords are also very concerned about the strength of the Arryn clan now that Robert is nominally in charge. Right. A six-year-old who doesn't seem like he's uh, a particularly brave or <laughs> <laughs> lordly six-year-old. Yeah, Brenda mentions that he's prone to cry if you take his dolls away. Not exactly yeah. <laughs> filling them with uh, confidence that he's going to get the job done yeah. here. So basically, the, the the lords are sort of hoping that she'll that Liza will either take a husband to act as a regent, or she'll remarry to have more children, and you know, yeah, maybe get rid of Robert somehow. And a lot of the lords of the Vale are specifically thinking that Nestor Royce should be a lord because he's been he's been the high steward in the Vale for the past fourteen years, while John Aaron has been in King's Landing. Right. I think he's also angling for her hand in marriage, right? He is, and yeah. she's already rejected him. Yeah. So, but Nestor Royce is the cousin of Jan Royce, Bronze Jan, and Nestor Royce is from kind of a lesser house of Royces. Kind of think of like Bronze Jan Royce, who is the father of Sir Waymar, who we lost in the prologue oh, yeah. and then came back. Uh, think of of Bronze Jan Royce. As like the Casterly Rock Lannisters and Nestor Royce is like the Lannisport Lannisters. Nice analogy, I like it. Although, I mean, Nestor's is Nestor's family home, um, the Gates of the Moon. I don't know if it's his fan. It's the Aaron's family home because they winter there. So while they're in the Eyrie, I see. He, I see. He is the Lord of the Gates of the Moon. When they come down, I assume they they resume uh, he, primary He moves ownership. into the guest room. Yes, yes. exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I see. So Lysa keeps uh, rejecting potential suitors. Um, Kat argues to Brynden that a woman can rule as well as a man. Uh, the Blackfish tells her that Kat maybe could be able to do it, but Lysa certainly can't. She's not the girl that she knew. Right. Uh, two stillbirths, four miscarriages, and now Robert's all she lives for, and that is clouding her judgment. Yep, and that takes me back to when I said a few episodes ago not to overlook John Aaron's idea of having Robert Aaron fostered at Dragonstone, that I didn't think that would sit well with Liza. And as we see in this chapter, she's pretty attached to the kid. <laughs> Quite literally, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, that, I mean, her reasons for fleeing King's, King's Landing definitely appear to be twofold. They're getting away from the Lannisters for to whom she apportions blame for her husband's death, but also to avoid the fostering of Robert. Yes, I think that had a lot to... In fact, Brendan also, I think, mentions that she fled to prevent Robert from being fostered because King Robert was going to have that done. Yeah, which, I mean, if you think about it, I mean, just taking away sort of a mother's love, which, you know, hey, I understand... It probably would be good for Robert. He probably needs a little bit of toughening up. Dragonstorm with Stannis, maybe that's a bit too much. (laughs) (laughs) Casterly Rock with Tywin Lannister, also a little bit scary. You know, maybe somewhere just a little bit nicer. Right, there's got to be a middle ground somewhere. Maybe Renly, you know, sort of like, (laughs) yeah. A little bit hard to read, but generally likable, you know. (laughs) So, yeah, uh, Brendan mentions that the Lannisters are what? Liza fears most, and Kat has brought the Lannisters to the Vale, and uh, as she puts it, in chains. And he's like, I don't see any chains. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I see a dirk in his belt and a, a what does he say, a cell, sh- a cell sword uh, who's following him around like a dark shadow or something like that. Uh-huh. But, uh, but you know what? She made the right decision. I mean... If he was in chains, they'd all be dead 10 miles back up the road. Right, you know? yep. So, uh, so it takes the whole day to go across the Vale. Night has fallen by the time they reach the Gates of the Moon. Cat gets vertigo looking up at the lights of the Eyrie. So she's hoping that they've been told it'll take an, a day to climb all the way up to the Eyrie. Yeah. Um, so she's hoping for a night's sleep. But once she gets there, it's announced that... Uh, 
Liza wants her there, wants her cat up in the area as quickly as possible. So she's forced to travel at night. Yeah, and Brendan, you kind of get the idea because of Brendan's reaction, how odd and dangerous that request is because he's like a, a nighttime descent and especially the moon's not even full. Even Liza should know that's asking for a broken neck. We get the idea um, that this is not just a something that happens regularly. Yeah. So. Uh, technically, I think it would be an ascent, not a descent. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, ascent. Yeah. Hopefully not a descent. I wrote descent in my... <laughs> yes. Hopefully at some point there's a descent as well. <laughs> slow descent. <laughs> yeah. Very, a very slow and arduous ascent followed by an immediate and crippling descent. Yeah. Um, there's, there's one line where... Uh, so... The way it works is the Gates of the Moon is the primary castle at the bottom of the Giant's Lands. I don't know how far down they are. I mean, but kind of at the base of where they are at the Giant's Lands. And then there's three way castles on the way up the Giant's Lands, which is the name of the mountain, that lead to the Erie. And uh, we'll, we'll get, we won't get much into the details, but they kind of decrease in size as you go up. The stone is bigger than snow is bigger than sky. Yeah, but each one is as, as you're getting higher, it's getting more treacherous. You don't need as big a castle. Right. You just need a few. Basically, by the time they get to Sky, they just need a few rocks, and they drop those down smartly, <laughs> and no one's climbing up. Yeah, there. exactly. And uh, Tyrion says, uh, "If you plan on uh, having me climb that thing, uh, climb this mountain, just kill me now." And, <laughs> and they uh, they mention uh, Brenda mentions that there's baskets that that you could go up in uh with the turnips and the potatoes and the stuff they're usually meant for food but you could also ride up in them and they they come into play here in a minute yeah but they they only run from sky up to the eerie right they're not all the way from the bottom i think yes i think everything has to go by by mule up to the sky up to sky yeah up through the first few castles yes and uh, and that's probably smart as well i mean you can imagine that if the if the baskets run all the way from the ground, I mean, first of all, you need a really long <laughs> yes, chain. <you> <laughs> and secondly, they uh, they would actually be a vulnerability if you could imagine sort of uh, an army right. climbing up there somehow. Yeah. And uh, this is where Tyrion makes one, well, at least at the moment, final plea to Kat for his innocence. She says, he says he can't go up in the baskets, that there's there's Lannister pride, he can't ride with the turnips. And she says, it's not pride, it's arrogance, avarice, and lust for power. And he responds with, Jamie is, he admits Jamie is arrogant. His father is, the, I think he says, like the, the soul of avarice or something like that. And Cersei, a lust for power with every breath. But I am innocent. Shall I bleat like a lamb for you? Yeah. It's got to get her. Th- it's got to get her thinking. I mean, she's already having second thoughts. Yeah, and... but she's so far down this rabbit hole. There's, even if by now she's thinking, "Oh man, he might be innocent." What's she gonna do at this point? Yeah. So, um, when they reach the gates of the moon, Nestor Royce meets them. Um, he gives them something to eat. Tells Cat that she's wanted immediately up in the area, and introduces her to Maya Stone, who'll be her guide up the mountain. Sweet kid. She's a sweet kid, and she's apparently very good at her job. Everyone yes. seems to really trust her. Yes, but uh, as astute listeners will note, her name is Stone, and Stone is the name that people of the Vale are given if they are natural born. Right. So uh, this reminds Cat of Jon Snow. Although she won't call him Jon Snow, she says Ned's bastard at the wall. She mm-hmm. still won't use his name. Which remember way back in Cat Two. She used his name for what he said. No, it was John too. Sorry, he used. She used his name for the first time when she said it should have been you. So, yes, back yes. again. She's not using his name anymore. I feel like you twisted the knife there. You didn't need to remind me of that moment. <laughs> <laughs> but one thing that's it, it, it does mention that she feels some guilt, there, which is interesting. Yeah, that you know, all this time we've thinking we were thinking she should feel guilt about the way she treated John, and it men- it is, gets mentioned here. So that's. That's to her credit. Yeah, it's a little something. It's a little something. Yeah. But we get a lot now from here. There's a lot of description of, as they, as Maya and Kat, make their way from the Gates of the Moon up to the Eerie. It's pretty cool description. There's not a whole lot that we need to talk about. Um, yeah, it's not really germane to them. Yeah. Apart from the fact that it really does seem impregnable yes. to 
invade the Eerie. I mean, there's just no way you could do it. Right. And one thing about Maya is she mentions uh, that her boyfriend, Michael Redfort, said that her she's so good at climbing that her father must have been a goat. But in fact, her father was not a goat. Her father is, in fact, King Robert Baratheon, first of his name. This is Maya Stone. It is Maya Stone. I didn't piece this together. <laughs> huh. How about that? I read this whole chapter and it never even occurred to me. This is Maya Stone. This is Maya Stone, yes. So this is his oldest child, It is, right? yes. This she is, is his oldest yeah. child, yeah. How interesting. Red, Ned, uh, Red, yeah, Ned just... He was a bit of a goat, honestly. <laughs> <laughs> Ned just uh, referenced her a few, a few Ned chapters ago. Yeah, very recently, yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I remember it. Oh, it was the it Gendry chapter, recent. right? Was it? Was it? Or may, it was about Gendry. No, I think it was no. It was after that he was reminiscing about how, oh, uh, maybe it was Gendry because he was reminiscing about how fond Robert was of his children. Right. Yeah. It was in that. I chapter. think he was thinking, why is Gendry so special? He's got Edric Storm in yeah, Storm's yeah, End, yeah. and he's got Maya Stone in the Veil. Vale. You know, I think it was the chapter. I think it was basically the last chapter. It was when Ned quit as Hand. It was. It was when he was thinking after quitting as Hand. Oh, uh, was it? Okay. Well, then that was. Like just last, the last chapter, I mean, <laughs> just yeah. give or take, which is why I remember. <laughs> hey, Maya Stone. I didn't remember when I was reading it. I was like, "Who's this Maya Stone person?" You know. But aside so from that, so Maya Stone, we're gonna gonna edit all this out and go, oh, "Yeah, Maya Stone, <laughs> bastard daughter of King Robert." But um, aside from that detail, it's just a harrowing climb, like Simon mentioned in the uh, in the summary. They go from castle to castle, and a, a near death experience, cat is pretty sure she's about to die and it ends with her in a food basket. She said, I'm not too proud, proud to ride with the turnips. So. Yeah. Neither, neither would I be. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's exhausting to read this, you know, to actually, I mean, she's ridden for days without a proper rest, you know, and then she's ridden all day across the Vale and then climbed up a mountain all night. Yeah. In fact, at one point she falls asleep on the mule. It seems on like. The mule, yeah. yeah. So she reaches the Eyrie first thing in the morning, and she's met by Savardis Egan and Master Coleman, Maester Coleman. Uh, it's small by the great by the standards of most great castles, but you know, hey, it's perched on a mountain. You right. do what you can in terms of building. <laughs> and, uh, of course, it doesn't need smiths, kennels, uh, stables, right. any of that stuff, because nothing can get up there. But it does have a huge granary, so it's basically invulnerable to uh, siege, siege as well. At least yeah. it would take a long time to see. Yeah, I mean, if you sat there long they go, enough, <laughs> they get bored of porridge. Right, <laughs> we give up. But she mentions that it's oddly empty; that there's hardly anybody around when she's walking through it. The hallways are empty and stuff. So it's early, and it's hard to get up to. <laughs> yes, sensible people are still about. Tyrion yeah. does mention when when they look up and when Cat gets the vertigo looking up so high, he says the errands must uh, not be fans of company. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, he's a good one. Uh, he's funny. Yeah, that, he's Tyrion. funny, that Tyrion. Um, so the five years haven't been kind to Lysa, in Kat's opinion. She's two years younger, but now she looks older. She's gained weight. She's puffy faced. Um, so while everybody's in the room with her, so that would be Maester Coleman, Sir, uh, Sir Vardis Egan, and I think uh, Lysa's own servant. Yes, yeah. yes. I think there was some servant. She's, um, she's perfectly pleasant and seems like this won't be so bad but then she dismisses everyone but cat and then her demeanor changes have you taken leave of your senses bringing him here without word of permission without so much as a warning to drag us into your quarrels with the lannisters yeah. which of course that's ironic because cat sees this as first and foremost lysa's quarrel yeah, with the lannisters exactly that's her response our quarrel this was your quarrel first sister but then obviously the coded message was the code was not as easy to break as Cat thought because the coded message meant the Lannisters killed my husband. Don't, whatever you do, go anywhere near them or get involved <laughs> with them in any way. What Cat read was the Lannisters killed my husband. Seek revenge. Well, see, what happened was she burnt that letter so quickly she forgot to flip it over. Oh, <laughs> there was a whole yes. second page on the back that said, gotcha. don't get involved. <laughs> that makes so much sense. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's pretty much what she says. I told you that so you could stay away from them. I never meant to fight them. Yeah. 
So little Robert enters the room. Cat describes him as painfully thin, small for his age, shaking, sickly. Yeah. She compares him to Rickon. <laughs> we, we love Rickon. He's just a great backdrop character to the whole thing. I like how they, she worded it too. She said she remembers her son Rickon. And I was like, you remember? You remember? <laughs> yes, finally. You remember Rickon? <laughs> I don't know where he is. <laughs> <laughs> that he's half Robin's age, Robert's age, but five times as fierce. Yeah. But to be fair to Robert, Rickon is clearly pretty feral. Yeah. There's not a lot of parenting going he's on with that child. Literally being raised by wolves right now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yes. But... So uh Kat continues to discuss matters of importance and state with Lysa, but Lysa shoots her down that she's not to speak in, like that in front of the baby. Yeah, Lysa says He's the Lord of the Eerie and defend, uh, Defender of the Veil. <laughs> and, and if you want, True Warden of the right. East as well, you know. Yeah, so you can kind of get the rest of the Veil's concern. If anybody who's met this kid, you might be like, ah, uh, this is our Defender of the Veil. Yeah. yeah, which is, again, why every one of them would be like, let's go get him fostered somewhere, right. somewhere brutal. It's going to bring him up right. I know where, Pike. Pike, <laughs> oh, man. Man. Those gray joys oh. would really toughen that kid up. <laughs> yeah, Winterfell. Yeah, Winterfell would be a good choice. Yeah, yeah. You know? Of course, there's no one there. I mean, you'd be raised by Rickon, basically. <laughs> <laughs> so that would toughen him up. <laughs> no, no, more, no more breast milk from his mother. It's from the wolves. <laughs> Oh, we should sure crack ourselves up. That's... We do. That's why we do this. Uh, yeah. So Robert begins breastfeeding. Cat thinks, is this really John Aaron's son? Yeah. And uh, Liza is, but he said the seed is strong. That's the, that was his last words. He was saying how strong his son is, but I'm not sure that's what he meant. <laughs> <laughs> if he did, he was delirious. <laughs> cause... <laughs> There's nothing strong about this scene. Did they mention whether the tears of Liss also create a delusion <laughs> as one of its symptoms? If so, maybe that's what he meant. <laughs> Things that shake appear very solid. <laughs> Things that are thin appear stout. Yeah, uh, but, you know, that's the... She mentions, is this really John Aaron's son? Well, she doesn't mention it, good Lord. That wouldn't go over well, but she thinks it. No. And yeah. that's it's come up at least... I know Brendan... Uh, her uncle Brendan Blackfish Tully mentions the same thing that by all accounts he's uh, John Aaron's son. You know, he's not saying I don't think he's John Aaron's son, but he's saying, "Boy, this he just by all accounts he's John Aaron's son, but uh, it sure doesn't fit the bill." <laughs> and it got me wondering. You know, Liza's in her early thirties now, and John Aaron's in his late seventies. You know, it's possible that could be someone else's son you know oh, well <laughs> i'm not saying how about that i'm just saying <laughs> but i mean but but i mean you can have a child that's not like i mean look at look at molly ray she's cute <laughs> and sweet and delightful that's true good apple could not have fallen further from the tree <laughs> you make a solid point the defense rests <laughs> but but she does look like you <laughs> so uh liza is adamant that they're safe from Lannister's attack the eerie does appear impregnable cat tells her no castle is yeah um, it, of, it's very rare that i think i will be agreeing with liza but on this one it looks it feels pretty impregnable yeah it kind of depends i mean l like we said i mean it's obviously it's extremely well i guess getting into the veil is very difficult too i mean that's the thing you've got there's there's two things you've got to do to defeat the arons you've got to invade the veil and then somehow get them out of the Eyrie. Right. Now you can, the second half of that is clearly just a siege. You just lay siege to them and just wait them out, just starve them out. I mean, yep. we know how that feels right this moment. Yeah. <laughs> We're all stuck here. I'm having oatmeal every day. We have, we haven't shopped for uh, two and a half weeks. Wow. Now. You are seriously responsible citizens making your own to toilet paper. <laughs> reusing <laughs> um so that part of it is clear what you have to do and and it wouldn't take that big of a force to lay siege to it because you could just in the same way it's hard for an army to climb up it's hard for an army to climb down right 
you would only need a few hundred men to stop anyone getting out of the Erie. Right. But the hard part is getting into the Vale, because to get into the Vale, you've got to run the gauntlet of the hill tribes. Right. Okay, you've got a big enough army, they're going to stay clear of you. But then you've got to get through the bloody gate. Yes. And that one is a tough nut to crack. That, I think, as she says, uh, 12 armies have smashed themselves to bits on the bloody gate yeah. trying to get through. And and the Vale is rich and fertile. They There's no way to lay siege to the bloody gate. You've got to get through there somehow. Yeah. And it seems that, that maybe that one is... That's why you might think this genuinely is impregnable. And it's also it's an incredibly narrow part in the pass. I think she said only four people abreast at right. that point. So anyway, we'll talk about the bloody gate here in a minute. Yeah. But she realizes that Brendan did try to warn her that Liza is a different person than the Liza she knew. And doesn't look like she's going to have a lot of rational conversations with her dear sister. Yeah. But keep the servants around is the secret. At least then. (laughs) It's only when they were out of the room, things got out of hand. Uh, So young Robert asks Lysa if they can make the bad man, Tyrion, fly. Lysa says, perhaps that's just what we'll do. So obviously, I'm not exactly sure what they're talking about, but they're up on a very high mountain. (laughs) And (laughs) there's a suggestion that throwing people off said mountain might be the traditional way of uh, punishing people. When Kat looks up from the Gate to the moon looks up and up and up and gets vertigo. She says, up where the falcons fly. So uh-huh. things are flying up there. Yep. Yep. I'm thinking Tyrion wouldn't fly. No, I don't think Not so. Not for long. No. I guess. All right. You got some background? Sure. So let's talk about the uh, Bloody Gate real quick. So as we mentioned, the Bloody Gate is a series of battlements. Uh, as we know, it's located on the high road which leads into the Vale proper from the Mountains of the Moon. There are two long parapets built into the stone of the mountain. Like I mentioned, the high road is very narrow here, and the two towers are joined by a covered bridge that arches above the road. Defenders can fire through arrow slits in the towers, bridge, and battlements, and it's said the Bloody Gate can provide respite for at least a few thousand men. And the commander of the gate is called the... Knight of the Gate, which currently the distinction goes to Brendan Blackfish Tully. Uh-huh. His question that he asked Cat and Sir Donal when, when they met at the Bloody Gate, who would pass the Bloody Gate, is the standard question he asks all who wish to enter. It was originally a rough-hewn, unmortared wall until Osric V, Aaron, King of the Mountain and the Vale, had it built into the structure that it is today. And like Cap hmm. mentioned, a dozen armies, and I think I just mentioned this a few minutes ago, a dozen armies have smashed themselves to bits upon the gate. Most famously, Halak Hor, remember, that's H-O-A-R-E. H-O-A-R-E. Yep. The king of the isles and the rivers, and father of Heron the Black, who built Heron uh, Hall. Heron Hall. <laughs> Name check. Oh, so Halak Hor failed to conquer the bloody gate three times himself, so... To be honest, I would see that as something of a success. I mean, to actually get a couple more bites right. out of that cherry. <laughs> Most people would die. <laughs> so he was actually one of the more successful invaders. So um, the other castle that gets a mention here is uh, the Gates of the Moon. The Gates of the Moon was the first seat of House Arryn in the Vale. The castle is actually larger than the Eyrie because it's easier to build on the floor than it is to build on the top of a mountain. Sure. However, the Gates of the Moon was considered by some to be not suitable for kings, and the fourth Arryn monarch, Roland I, found it lacking in comparison to Grand Castley Rock and Hightower. He thought of rebuilding, but instead decided to build the Eyrie high on the giant's lands. So the Gates of the Moon has since been used by House Arryn as their seat during winter. Uh-huh. You told me this. I do know a few things. The keepers of the gate <laughs> you do. The keepers of the Gates of the Moon, currently Nestor Royce, have since held the castles for the Arryns. So, um, comparison with the television show? Yes, let's hear. Oh, you you told us some already, I guess, at the very beginning. I did. I did. Well, I didn't really mention it. I didn't really. I I wasn't actually going to cover that. It's just because you were so waxing lyrical about ah. the veil. I was I was mentioning that there was no real mention of the veil. There are some other big differences. Um, they are met on the road by Savardis Egan, who in the book we only meet Savardis when she gets into the eerie. Okay, so he re- basically replaces Sir Donald Wainwood. He replaces Sir Donald Wainwood and Brandon Blackfish Tully, oh. who does not appear at all in this wow okay it's uh it's a wainwood who marches them through the bloody gate and i the gates of the moon doesn't even exist here because it's just a causeway right. to the eerie okay so 
Um, and again, you don't see anything but the causeway and the castle, really. Um, so it looks more like a remote mountain retreat than a mountain retreat adjacent to a very well protected and fertile valley. So it does look a lot more vulnerable. Okay. In the show, uh, there's no separation of Cat from the rest of the crew. This whole nighttime climb doesn't happen. They all go up there together because it isn't as difficult to get up there. It's just a long march along an exposed and narrow causeway. Okay. So they yeah. just all they just all go en masse. The interview with Liza is not in private. Uh, Cat's entire company is present. Robert is there from the get go, and Liza is just as crazy in front of everybody as she is <laughs> in private. She's not putting on pretenses. <laughs> no, She's keeping no, no. her real. <laughs> yeah. So and uh, and the disturbing breastfeeding also occurs. <laughs> Something's just occurred to me actually. Um, all of the wolves in uh, Winterfell are male, so the whole drinking oh, milk from the wolves right. it's, getting even, it's getting even worse. Yeah, yeah. So. Nymeria is uh, gone and Lady is no Somewhere longer with us. Very gone, yes. yeah. Pedantry? So uh, what, I, what I was meaning there is, it's just a little thing, but so when Sir Brendan offers Tyrion the option of riding up in the, uh, the turnip basket and he says, that his father would be too uh, ashamed of him if he did that, and so he can't he can't consider doing that. I thought, I don't know that Tyrion would really care that his father would be disappointed in him. <laughs> in, in some ways, that goes that sort of undermines his separation from the rest of his family that he claimed when he was claiming to be innocent as a lamb, <laughs> because you right. know he, he wouldn't care about their feelings right. as much and. Yeah, just a little thing, but I thought it just feels a little bit out of character for yeah. Tyrion. Yeah, I, I, I'm. I mean, just focusing back on the TV show again, just a little bit. I'm really glad we got to meet uh, Blackfish in this chapter. I think he's a fascinating yes, character. Yes, me too. And and I'm really curious as to what the animosity is between him and his brother. Uh, I I certainly don't remember it. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm looking forward to refining it out. I know. So I I I know some of the reasons that Hoster's not. Uh, is irked with Brendan. I'm not sure I can remember everything, but there is... In fact, Kat alludes to it in this chapter when Brendan says to Kat about... uh, Liza says she's going to uh, choose her own husband this time. And and Kat says, uh, you of anyone shouldn't fault her for that. Oh, he wanted to marry someone or did not want to marry someone. He did not want to marry someone, exactly. I see. His his big brother um, wanted him to marry someone. Interesting. Interesting. That would be really annoying. (laughs) Right. I mean, your father telling you you're going to marry someone, yeah, that's one thing, but your big brother doing it... (laughs) I don't have a big brother. I am a big brother. But I can imagine trying to get my little brother to do something like that. That wouldn't go well. No, I could see that. I could definitely see that. (laughs) So um, we're spending a lot of time in Westeros at the moment, but I I was trying to think why that was. And I think partly it's because last time we saw Danny, we jumped forward to her being pregnant. So we we gave ourselves a couple of months of Danny free time to keep developing what was going on in Westeros. Presumably when we go back to Danny, she'll be four or five months along and that will make sense. Yeah, yeah, that's true. You know who else is spending a lot of time in Westeros is George Martin. If you uh if you keep up with his blog, he mentions that he's because of the whole quarantine situation, he's been doing a lot of writing lately, so we should not let him know when the quarantine <laughs> Just keep him in there. <laughs> keep him in the dark. <laughs> we just pull the plug on his internet and just, you know, a feed of yesterday's news every day. Right. You know? It's Groundhog's Day for him. <laughs> well, that's exciting. Hopefully. Hopefully it means something. Yeah. Plus, it's good that he's quarantining himself away. Yes. The guy's absolutely. Not, not the first flush of youth and yeah, definitely doesn't want to catch it. Yes. Just to let you know, my brother started a email thread with uh, my extended family back home. Is that the one you tried to forward me, but my uh, inbox was full? Correct, yes. And this thread has now broken down into a long list of laughing at my American accent. <laughs> That's what's happened. You're... Everyone's like, listen to that guy. He sounds like an idiot. You're, you're a pirate slash John Wayne. <laughs> 
Exactly. With just a hint exactly. of, uh, oh, shoot. What's her name? Oh, uh, yes. Scarlett O'Hara. Not Rhett Butler. Scarlett <laughs> yeah. O'Hara, that's it, yeah. Just a hint <laughs> of right. Scarlett O'Hara. <laughs> Which is, which I think is how John Stewart does Lindsey Graham. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, the vapors, Lordy, I do declare. Um, other thing I was going to tell you is, I see all of those people when I go to England, and but I, when I'm in England, my accent fades back oh, into okay. its Englishness. Yeah. You see, so they are all really surprised by how I sound. So it's it's literally talking to you makes this. Uh, I'm having a negative influence on you. Well, an influence. It I mean, influence. Right. Some might see it negative, some might see it as positive. <laughs> but, but I'm sure they're going to boost our numbers dramatically, the mighty clan McGraw. All right. I would like to see it. All right. All right. So let's conclude. So Kat is finally having the internal struggle about Tyrion's innocence and guilt that she should have had before she dragged him off to <laughs> yeah. the Vale. Yeah, there's, it's definitely a heavy cost to get him to the Eyrie. Aside from the six men that have died in the process, which is, you know, very sad in its own right, she could be well on her way home to her two, oh, wait, no, three <laughs> sons. I was, I was prepping for the same joke. I was going to say, to see. <laughs> I can see it in your face. <laughs> I was all ready to go. To see Bran. <laughs> I've forgotten the other one's name. Rob! And the other one! <laughs> the third one. <laughs> yeah. Why are there three wolves? Oh, that's right. <laughs> Where is that kid? <laughs> yeah. So, and also, I mean, I guess the other thing it's doing is now she's having to confront the possible craziness of her sister, yes. which she could perhaps have lived without being exposed to. Yes. It's, it's not looking like if it does come to war, she's going to get a ton of help from the veil vale. no they they won't work against it doesn't seem North, like it yeah but they're they're not going to work for either and i'm guessing the the starks would be expecting to count on lady stark's sister uh to yeah. help out it doesn't look like it's although i mean i mean i guess i guess the hope if you know a big war comes is that other lords of the veil vale impress upon her the need she's at the moment she's saying no but you know if if open war happens they might right obviously the voice is telling her we've got to go out there and do something will increase in volume robert aaron doesn't inspire a lot of confidence i mean no. literally jamie is a better Lord of the East. <laughs> right. he had, doesn't have the veil at his best interest at heart at all but he can't be worse <laughs> but you wonder could it cause a coup? Is that yeah? Now? I mean, I think I think for now the the lords of the Vale will. I mean, obviously she's an Aaron now, right? And there's a lot, you know, a long tradition. This is an old noble family. They're not gonna usurp. They they would rather usurp through marriage, through right. cajoling. They're not gonna. But at some point, you could put. She's not actually an Aaron. Yeah, put her in a in a jail cell and say, "I'm taking over until Robert's old enough to be right." Yeah, to be in charge, and in the meantime, I'm going to raise him in a way that is going to turn him into a lord. Wouldn't be the worst idea I've ever heard. Yeah, yeah. But but has Cat found an ally in uh, her uncle Brendan? Well, yeah. You know, I mean, he seems like a pretty level headed guy. Obviously, he cares deeply for her, but he still serves the crazy one. Meaning yeah. Liza Aaron, so I don't know how yeah. much use he can technically be. Yeah. We'll find out. And Tyrion and Bronn continue to become friends. Yeah. Um, like you said earlier, yeah. you know, uh, it depends on if he's pl- if Bronn's playing the short game or the long game here. Short right. game, do what you're told by Cat. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But I don't know what you do now. I mean, if you think about it, the only way out of the Vale is back the way they came. Right. They're gonna need bodyguards for that journey too. You would think. So. <laughs> Don't know where that's going. And the veil. I am in love with the description of the veil. Well, good. I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad. Anything else? No, I think we're good. All right, me too. All right. As always, you can reach us at ghost.harrenhall at gmail.com. Follow us on Twitter at Ghost Harrenhall, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube. Yep. And if you please wouldn't mind going out and leaving us a review iTunes, uh, Apple Podcasts, podchaser.com, anywhere that would really be great, would really help us out. 
Bye. All right. Well, as always, thanks for listening. Thanks. Bye. Bye.